So I want to thank you very much for your introduction. I will welcome everybody to this uh, second, uh, second demonstration. So I didn't know that I'm a uh, star, so I get a little bit nervous now. Pressure rises now. I like to demonstrate it to you, I hope in a very clear way. I, I try to give you tips and tricks for this kind of search. We are talking about functional evaluation test. May I ask you, the audience, and thank you for coming in such a high number. Um, who is a beginner of you? Hopefully there are many beginners. So please raise up your hand. Okay, thank you very much. That is the, the right course you're attending. And who is the more advanced or the super expert? Okay, there are some. Okay, hopefully we can give you as well some advice, tips and tricks. And we have a very nice cadaver. Um, I would like to um, say thank you to the Stoltz company. I mean, they are always doing a great job. I mean, it's uh, uh, Mrs. Hartmann and Mr. Leis and uh, Antonio Lucata, um, as well my nurse here. It's Katharina, and she worked with me many years in Munich. She's still in Munich. She, she changed a little bit because of personal reasons, and she comes here at Thessaloniki. So she's a local, and thank you, Katharina, for all your time and your input um, to come here and help us. So, well, what we like to show it to you um, is a, uh, a full nasal endoscopy and all the possibilities we do have for endoscopic approaches. Um, however, please keep in mind, this what we show you here is not routine step by step. It's just a demonstration and very important. When you have your patient, you always individualize, you always tailor your surgical treatment to the individual needs. That's very important. So first, we would like to introduce a little bit to the setup, which is for me very important. I mean, I can just rush in the dissection, but let me take five minutes to demonstrate. We have this so-called Navicard. It's a video tower. And you have different things. This is for demonstration a little bit more than we have in our OR. But we have a monitor for the endoscopic picture as well a monitor for the navigation system. And we're using navigation. Why? Because we are definitely convinced it's more precise, it's more personalized, it's more predictable when you use navigation. So we already were using the pathway software to put in points where we can reach up into the frontal sinus, left, right side, we will see how much we can dissect, as well into the sphenoid sinus. So um, we have as well the option for powered instrumentation. It's the shaver, which makes sense in cases with nasal polyps, maybe tumors, inverted papilloma, or even when you have to drill and uh, there's a new drill system here. It's a 35,000, you know, unit uh, drill. And I think it's very nice in case you have to make a drill out procedure. But this is not the focus. I think we will talk in the next days about, you know, what kind of concept makes sense. Drill is fine, but drill is the tip of the pyramid. And that belongs only to a little number of patients. So we will see if we can show it to you. Hopefully, we can show some, you know, uh, use of the drill as well. So now coming to the instrumentation, to the classical one. So this is a luxury collection, of course. But I think you have to have special instruments to perform this kind of surgery. We are talking about Messerklinger and Stamberger's technique, the school of Graz. I don't show you anything different. And the instruments are very, very helpful for this, otherwise you cannot do it. The straightforward instrument using a zero degree endoscope. And when you go around the corner to the maxillary sinus or to the frontal, we, I personally, use the 45 degree endoscope. Heinz Stamberg used for many years the 30, but then became the 45 degree endoscope. The thing, these both endoscopes are fine. In rare cases, we are using a 70 degree when you have to look into the maxillary sinus to the alveolar recess if there's any pathology. So um, 
the instruments here you will see during the dissection step by step and I will describe how they work and when you should use it. So now coming to the to the patient. Now I behave during the dissection definitely like I would be in the OR and the patient is in the same position. The head is slightly uh, um, rotated in my direction and we have the upper body of the patient 30 degrees elevated. There's a nice paper which shows the bleeding is reduced. It's a so-called reverse Trendelenburg position. So for me it helped for 20 years. It's fantastic. And then um, very important you have the camera and you have your endoscope. And you could have an HD camera or even a 4K camera, which is nice. The picture is a bit brighter, so it's up to you and to your administration what you get. Um, very important in the handling is, first, you look into the camera and you clean it here very, very gently. Please pay attention, but sometimes there's some debris on it. And you always have a bad picture. So it's the same here on the ocular and on the tip, and it should be in good quality. So you can check it here, the light as well here, if there are broken cables or not. So these are things you should know, and then you're more happy with this kind of procedure. So when you use the endoscope and the camera to introduce it in the nose, and now we're coming slightly to the surgical procedure itself, I'm not sure if you can see it in this corner, but very important is to hold the endoscope like I show it to you now. I go in, we are here passing the nasal valve on the right side of the specimen, and you press your endoscope here in the upper part of the vestibulum nasi, and you have a, a very stable situation and to work under the endoscope. It's very important, otherwise we don't have the space. So keep it quiet, don't shake. I hope I'm not shaking, but I think the picture sh should be fine. And now we are facing already very nicely into the septum, which is a little bit deviated. And we are having here a little septum spur or crest. We have the inferior turbinate. We have a nice view onto the middle turbinate and here in between the unsnet process. So my question is, would you, how would you handle this septum? Maybe it's making the entrance in the middle matrix a bit this? And if yes, how, may I ask you? Just give me some recommendations. Okay, you would remove it, how would you... Well, classical septoplasty. Okay, that's good. So you would do a so-called whatever mini septoplasty or endoscopic guided one. That's what we do in many cases. So this is what I want to give you as another, you know, tips and tricks just to handle this endoscopically. This is very easy. Now, when we have a look in the, in, in the nose like this, we can do a nasal endoscopy which is in three different steps. Step number one, and this is what Heinz Stamberger teach me over years and it's now, it's very much inside. Now we are going, we are pathing here, the nasal cavity here along the inferior turbinate very gently even with the spur and the crest Maybe it's possible, I try to go in and now I'm passing, I try not touching the mucosa and now we are reaching the nasopharynx. On the left side, very nice, the Eustachian tube, the rose nasopharynx and in case you would have a 30 degree endoscope, you even could rotate your endoscope and look down to the larynx in a patient who is sleep is just, you know, a nasal endoscopy. You could even um, control the larynx in this direction. So I'm coming back now, coming from the first step, 
the position one of nasal endoscopy to the second one, we are coming back. Maybe the spur and the crest is a little bit, you know, altering your, oops, this is, this is already the surgery, you know, thanks very much. You see, um, I come back and now we are facing the middle meatus. I come in again. I go in again. It's a bit narrow, but here, this is position number two. We are going in between the middle turbinate and the septum here in the so-called sphenoidmoidal recess. And usually you would see, or you could in some cases see the natural ostium of the sphenoid sinus. It must be here in the depth, just the cleft, the very narrow cleft there. There should be the natural ostium and we are coming back a little bit more and now we are going under the inferior part of the middle turbinate and we are looking now into the middle matus and what you can see here is an opening. What do you think what this is? Is it the natural ostium of the maxillary sinus? Okay, it's a so-called accessory ostium. It's a a perforation in the periost of the medial maxillary sinus wall and uh, it depends on the case if you have to deal with this, if you have to combine with the natural osteum. So we will see later on. I come back again a little bit now. Um, Freya, please. Now I try to go in and very slightly here to pull or push a little bit the middle turbinate, but please don't fracture the middle turbinate. And now what we are facing is, we are facing now the anterior wall of the etmoidal bulla, as well here the free margin of the unsnap process. And what I usually do is I try the flexibility of the unsnap process, which you can feel here for later on to know where we have or where we can resect the unsinate process. Now, looking a little bit higher up, we are looking in the direction of the frontal recess. And the frontal recess, there are some opening clefts. So maybe one of these are entering up into, into the frontal sinus. We will see later on as well about the attachment of the unsent process here cranially. So, and then position number three would be, you're looking very high up into the olfactory cleft here. And you can look here if there are any polyps, any tumors, any pathology. And this is a systematic endos endo nasal endoscopy which should be performed in every patient. So, I stay on this side. We will see how much we can do surgically. And now, before, before we do the um, first step of functional endoscopic scenery, we go maybe a little bit more here to the septal spur and crest. Bitte, mein Josef. Oder Sichelmesser erstmal. I take a sickle knife. And I can tell you, this is for me really something which is fantastic to use the endoscopic technique for dealing with septum, septal pathology. So what you could do, I mean, this was my fault, but it's better to see me fighting than doing a 100% perfect thing where you think, oh, it looks easy, but it is not. Now, I expose a little bit this bony or uh, cartilage part, please, um, Joseph. Or, uh, and what you can do, you can just elevate a little bit the, um, the mucosa of the septum. You do it superiorly and you can do it as well. This here is cartilage. You can do it as well inferiorly. And now Blakesley or a kleiner. Yeah. We have usually a very tiny Blakesley, it's called Strümpelchen, it's from the ear surgery, uh, but we don't have it on this collection. But this helps you in very narrow spaces 
even to work very, very atraumatic. And this is very important in this kind of surgery. I take it away. I mean, it's not a very difficult procedure here, but it should show you, you can do even septum surgery with really less traumatization. Please, uh, Joseph, again. <coughs> and even this space here would give the patient more space for breathing. You could as well go here and crack, perforate the bone like this here. Oops. And pay attention of perforating. Sometimes it happens, but you know, usually it's not a problem. Okay, so now, Blakesley. And the patient doesn't really feel that there was a lot of surgery done at the septum. So, going in here, oops, taking this out. Very gently, always look how you take out the bone because otherwise you can make some slight um, injury or cuts to the mucosa. Now I try to remove this as well. Good. So. Andreas, can I ask, what, yes? how do you prepare the nose uh, preoperatively? Ah, that's good, teeth? that's perfect. Thanks for the question, yes. Usually we use cotton swabs, which are soaked, but they should not drip. One to 5,000 with adrenaline. And we wanted to show you, but we don't have it here. And we place it in the middle mages around the middle turbinate. But before we make a slight injection, please give me the syringe. Yes. And with the syringe, and usually we have one to 100,000 adrenaline with lidocaine, we make exactly where the axilla of the middle turbinate is a slight injection of about 0 0.5 millimeters, not more. We do, do not inject here in several points, it's just one injection. And then we place the cotton swabs here around in the middle mages. It will be dilated a little bit, which helps you, and around the middle turbinate. And this lasts for eight to 10 minutes, and then you can start your procedure. And luckily we don't have any bleeding here, but I always feel it could bleed. I'm, I'm serious, so I handle this cadaver like I would do surgery. Now coming back here to the septum, can you see the difference? I mean, this is a very f easy and forward procedure, and now it's much better and it will heal nicely. You won't see anything, maybe a little groove, a little bit, but not more. So we will put some gel foam on this and that's it. That's, we don't have to do more. Okay, now let's come to the middle mages and to the first steps about FES. We are talking about the concept of functional endoscopic sinus surgery. Spare as much mucosa as possible. Now, um, give me the uh, sickle knife. Now, when we do the first steps for the resect or the, the resection of the unsnip process, you gently look again in. You have here a perforation, but now I think Maybe, I'm not sure if this is a perforation of the unsnip process or is it the medial wall of the maxillary sign? Maybe it's too low and that's because it's, it's a perforation of the medial wall of the maxillary sinus. Now, when you resect the unsnip process, you look for the attachment of the unsnip process and usually it's here, it's a so-called uh, maxillary line. It's where the os lacrimal is bulging and when you do the resection, you can do it in different ways. When you look in the literature, you may find 10 or even 15 different techniques. And all these techniques make sense. There's one traditional one. The tr traditional one would be you go with your sickle knife and you look where the attachment is, but you leave a little bit of remnant of the unsnip process here in place. Why? I will tell it to you later. Or backbiting instrument. You do a technique. 
uh, you do a technique which is, for me, maybe the safest technique using this instrument, but you see, it's bulgy. It's bulgy, it's very thick. And what I learned by Heinz, I remember when he told it to me, or when he showed in his dissection, you rotate a little bit this instrument, and now the diameter is less, you come back, you gently push the middle turbidate a little bit medially, and then you take your back biter, oops, I'm now out, I come in again, I go in, and you try to slip, hopefully it's working behind the unsnap process, behind the free margin of the unsnap process. And you can see now I could cut, but I want to show you two techniques, this technique, but let me make the first cut, the anterior uh, technique, and then you, you, you have seen already two techniques. I come again with a sickle knife, But maybe we show the uh, navigation. I mean, we have navigation, yeah? So please, navigation, Mrs. Hartmann. She did a fantastic job because she prepared everything. And now we are using navigation just to show you where we are. And uh, now this is the location where we are. We are just at the free margin of the Ansnet process. And you can see this line, and this is a pathway we were drawing in the CT scans board feedback by entering the frontal sinus. So we are going up here. Now let's have a look. The attachment of the unsnap process, it's up there. So you see we are not very high up, but we are reaching step by step here the frontal recess, the pre-chamber of the frontal sinus. And you should be sure where you are and if the system is really working. So you still are responsible for what the system is doing and, and if this is the case, it helps you a lot. So this is Edmoidal Bulla and you see now I think the uh, picture at the right top shows very nicely the Edmoidal Bulla and we are just on the anterior wall of this cell. So now, very good, very nice, um, sickle knife. I go in. Now I take my sickle knife, I look again, I look for the flexibility, and I make a, a small cut here, piercing, and you rotate, you go inferiorly, and during this maneuver, I try to pull the unsnap process medially. And what do we see now? There's some black hole. What's the black hole? Sorry? Have a look here. What is the hole? What is the opening? the natural osteum. This is your focus. This is the concept of Walter Messerklinger and Heinz Stamberger. Can you see the opening up there, the natural one, and the accessory osteum? And this is the relation. So um, we gently, you know, pull a little bit, not too much. We want to be very atraumatically. We rotate the sickle knife. We're going high up. So, step by step, and we are aiming the direction of the axilla of the middle turbinate. We're trying to reach, but we are not trying to touch the axilla of the middle turbinate. So, we want to be atraumatically. Very gently. Now, have a look here. Can you see? This is the bone of the unsnap process and the mucosa. Now I'm opening this and I'm looking in the infundibulum ethmoidale. And the way here, here, inside, here, through this corner, this is hiatus semilunaris, this is this space, and this is infundibulum ethmoidale, and here that's the natural ostium of the maxillary sinus. 
And this here is Edmodel Bulla. Now, please give me navigation. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes, just one second. Now we are going in, and you can see very nicely here the anterior wall of the Edmodel Bulla and the relation of the ANSNAP process. When I was young and started, this was very complicated for me, and I hope I can show it and you get a little bit more you know, understanding about the relationship. Yeah? And now uh, we want to show the pathway. It's number one. Please bring it in. And this is a pathway which we were using and uh, putting into the CT scan to get some help. I mean, I have done this curve. I don't know why, but you know, uh, when, the, when, the, when the points are not in one direction, maybe there's some, some little curve, but we will see how much this will support our search, but I'm sure it will. So please ausblenden. Okay, so now um, I show you the backbiting technique, the swinging door. No, uh, Let's assume we did not, we did not use the anterior technique, just, you know, place it back. You can't see anything. I go in again, very gently, try not damaging mucosa. Now you slip behind the ANSNIP process and you use your backbiter and you cut through like this. And now to take out the ANSNIP process, there are different techniques. You can use a sickle knife to do it stripe-wise. You can strip, pull. Please don't strip mucosa. Very important. Jetzt die Schere, die feine. What makes sense, and this is what I learned, to use some clear cuts, as long as you understand where, you, where are you. Now, I bring it a little bit more medially. And this is the so-called Messerklinger or Zurich scissor. And I cut the ANSNIP process superiorly. Oops, like this. There's still here a little bit attachment and I can promise you, as long as you use your cotton swaps and your atraumatic technique and you are nice to your anesthetist and you have a normal blood pressure, sometimes mild hypotension, it depends on the case, then you will see your structures. You can do precise sinus surgery according to Messerklinger and Stamberger. And for me, it's the most convincing technique. I can tell you, I do it now for 30 years or even more. Now, I take with a, with a Blakesley the ANSNAP process. I am not tearing. Now we have a look. And this is a specimen. Yeah, it's a, a tiny bony lamella covered by mucosa on both sides. And sometimes you have some polyps arising from this structure and, uh, and so it makes sense to go here to open to get more access to the inflammatory process, whatever you have to deal with. So now, Kuhnspoon, please. We are going in and uh, now we have still the attachment of the ANSI process here in place. That's the first basal lamella and this is helpful for navigation by anatomy. Now, the next step could be we can look a little bit up here, but this is the frontal recess area and we want to do it a little bit later. Maybe we clean this a little bit up here. We're taking this bony lamellas away. The giraffe, bitte. Andreas, you've, you've demonstrated beautifully there the, the two options of doing an onsenectomy, either doing a, a, an antigrade or a, a retrograde. Do you have a, a, a favored approach? Would you do, what would be your preference and why? Um, it depends. <laughs> um, I did for many years the classical approach, but then I had a surgical day where I had two or even three patients were always perforated in the lamina papyracea, and I was not 
I was not happy about this. And then I switched a little bit. But it depends a little bit on the anatomy. Sometimes the anterior approach makes sense and it's easy to go. And if not, you can just do this swinging door technique. So you have to individualize your surgical approach. That's very important. I was just thinking in particular that um, you've got a beautifully sharp sickle knife there. The, the majority of um, the sickle knives um, on the surgical sets tend stance. to be rather blunt. So this, the uh, swinging door technique is not the große. The swinging door technique is very, very helpful when you have a, a hypoplastic maxillary sinus because there is a very high risk of entering the orbit. So in this case, I would only use this technique and in other cases it depends. So this is the so-called infundibulotomy. Straightforward. But what would I do in a surgical case? I just do exactly what I do during surgery. Now, I come back with my zero degree, I go out with my zero degree endoscope, and I come again with another endoscope. Oops, like this here, that's for you. Okay. Now I take a 45 degree endoscope. Yeah. And we're using the navigation system as well the tracker system. So now, 45 degree endoscope, my favorite endoscope for what? For as well the maxillary sinus, as well the frontal sinus. I go in, very gently, the same situation. Please keep your endoscope in the same position. It helps a lot. I go in and now I have a very nice view up into the frontal recess. So in case of a patient and these openings, would your handle do it more? What would be the reason to go up into the frontal sinus or the frontal recess further than in the frontal sinus if there would be any pathology? But the openings and clefts are looking not bad, but we will look a little bit later. Now, I turn around the endoscope very easily and I want to look for the maxillary sinus opening. That's a natural opening. And what you see are two openings. And now, in case there's an indication to open it, but I don't know what's the best size, usually I try to expose the natural osteum and then it, is, it depends on the pathology. Give me a um, side biter. Now I show you the possibilities of the surgical techniques with different instruments. Yeah, Seitwärtsschneidende. You know, yeah, what I? Nee, die andere. Okay, so this is a very helpful instrument in going in. Now a little bit debris on my instrument. I'm going in and I can cut, zack. Make another cut, zack. And now I stopped opening the natural maxillary sinus osteum anteriorly because there's no reason, but it's n not at all a problem to enlarge it posteriorly in case there's an indication. Dann den schneiden in Blakesley, bitte. And I like especially this instrument. It's a through cutting instrument. You can go, you can cut, and you knips away. Here are some of the structures, or especially when you want to make a wide opening, but the, the Messerklinger Schere. And this is what I learned by my friend hans Rudi Brina, because I had a case, and I will show the case tomorrow in the first, you know, sessions when I'm talking about the concept of FES with a number of video clips, and hopefully you are coming. Um, I had a patient where I teared a lot mucosa by opening the maxillary sinus and then I changed my technique as well and what you can do you can make a, a clear cut here so you avoid tearing mucosa in this area and you leave the mucosa here at the roof of the maxillary sinus intact so please der schneid eine plexi noch mal ist das bild noch gut Okay, so I'm asking about the picture, if it's fine or not. So sometimes you can have a bleeder here, a spurting vessel. These are branches from the sphenopalatine artery. 
So you should be aware when you enlarge the natural osteum of the maxillary sinus, not posteriorly, yes, there can be as well, but more inferiorly where you find the attachment of the um, um, inferior turbinate. So I wouldn't do more here. That's looking all good. We spare mucosa. I tell you why, because mucosa is our friend. That's a functional organ of the nose. So can we my sauger anmachen? Der gebogene. Now I go in and I clean the maxillary sinus. When we were starting today at around 11 o'clock, we had an icy specimen, so it was still ice in all the cavities. And we got hot water and then we were melting all the ice away. And here should be fine now. You see, I'm going in and I can clean everything. The only thing is maybe you cannot reach alveolar recess properly, but you even see lymphatic vessels, the white ones, and the run of the infraorbital nerve. And how can you now deal with pathologies in this area? Bitte die Heuwieser. There's a very nice instrument. Uh, it's, it's called Heuwieser. The only thing is you have to bring this Heuwieser in the right way into the maxillary sinus and I rotate it in like this. Please don't injure the mucosa. Try to make it very gently, very soft. And then you can go here inferiorly. You can grab some pathology wherever it is. And if this is not long, long enough, this instrument, there are more, I think there are two more types, a long version and the oversized version, the XXL. And there's another version which has a broad, you know, tip. It's called Flamingo. And so you can deal very nicely endoscopically with pathologies in the maxillary sinus. So, well, this, this so far, how we deal after resecting the antsnap process, leaving the first basal lamella intact as a remnant for navigation by anatomy, we are facing it model bulla, and now we are looking up to the frontal sinus. And I'm not definitely sure, but I would like to check it with navigation. Mrs. Hartmann, please, that's your part. Okay, thank you. I'm getting the individual, individual bent um, um, na, a probe which we can use now. Bitte einzeichnen den Pfad, sieht man schon. Beziehungsweise, okay, so. Now, where to go up into the frontal sinus? This must be up there, the direction, isn't it nice? So we will see a bit later. There are a lot of openings, clefts here. You can see here, one is here. And when you, can, when you follow the top the, the CT scan at the top on the right side, you see there's a drainage pathway. Maybe this is a drainage pathway, could be. We will see later. There's one opening, there's another one, there's another one, and here it seems to be a cell. Maybe this is a supra, whatever, a bulla cell. Um, there's a nice classification by Peter Wormald and uh, expert group. I love this uh, classification. Um, it's named according to the anatomy, so we will see. Yeah, it's nice. I think it's a very nice cadaver. So, now, bitte ausschalten. Now, I come back um, with my zero-degree endoscope. Oops. I want to fish out this here. Okay, so I, s I s uh, change to the zero-degree endoscope. Why? because I would like to resect the um, etmoidal bulla. And for this, we have to see if there is air in the etmoidal bulla or not. Sometimes uh, etmoidal bulla can be very hot. Yeah. So thank you, Katharina, and thank you, Mrs. Hartmann. They are doing a great job. and. Without them, I wouldn't be able to do it in this way. Okay, so I go in. And once again, I would not behave different 
in the OR, it's definitely the same. For the time, I would be a little bit quicker, but because I talk a lot now, but you know, it takes a bit time. You can't do it in 10, 15 minutes. So now we are facing it, model Bulla, Kuhnspoon. We are going in very gently. This is our friend, the middle turbinate. We don't harm the middle turbinate. We leave it in place. Now, this is here the space between the etmoidal bulla and the middle turbinate. And there's some here, I don't know, remnants. I want to take it out. I want always to have a clean surgical field. Should be nice. I don't want to fracture uh, a lot of uh, bony lamellas and leave them inside? No. So now, the best way and my favorite how to resect the etmoid bulla is I stay immediately in inferiorly, I pierce here. Now I'm looking for, for the lumen of the etmoid bulla and it seems to be that I'm already in the etmoid bulla. I do it gently that you can understand how we should use the next step. So I break a little bit. I luxate a little bit. This tiny bony lamellas. So now, vial please. Now we have a vial. We had Blakesley, the side biting instruments, the back biter. Now we are taking a vial. We're taking the anterior face of the etmoidal bulla, but we try to leave here the basal lamella of the etmoidal bulla in place. Why? Because, and this could be another you know, way how to demonstrate, when you look for the maxillary sinus ostium and you are lost, sometimes this can happen, you look for the first basal lamella and the second, and usually in between these two basal lamellas, you will find the way into the maxillary sinus, but we already opened the maxillary sinus. Okay, let's go on. Okay, I try to knips away. I try avoiding tearing mucosa. You see, I'm sometimes very angry with me when I'm using an instrument and, and I'm tearing, I'm denodating bone, but sometimes this happens. But in this case, you can really replace the mucosa and cover the bone again. So um, just take your time. Do you ever use through cutting instruments to avoid? Yes, healing? thanks, Sean. Thanks. I was thinking you are, you are reading my thoughts. Yeah. So please give me the through cutting instrument because here it's a danger that Schneiden um, Blakesley. Now, in case you want to do it very atraumatically, you take this instrument. And we knip it away a little bit. Oops. Okay, yeah. When I tear mucosa, this is, of course, for demonstration. Um, and now the tiny lamellas, I take it out like this here. If there are any questions from the audience, there are a couple of microphones at the front. Please feel free to step down and ask some questions. So, what is important when we're dealing with the etmoidal bulla? What, what side, what, which lamella? So, I think in, in a lot of cases, when you look in patients who were operated, you will see that the medial wall of the etmoidal bulla is still in place and it's here, this one here. And that's the source of recurrent infection. So we have to resect this as well. Okay, I clean the endoscope again. And you see I'm through cutting this, instru uh, this anatomical structures. Yeah. So I'm going here, check. And I tell you, when you do a, a surgical procedure like this, of course, we are talking about the right indication. But then most of the patients are not requiring any nasal packing. 
and the patients are having no pain. They feel great. They say, well, doctor, listen. And I always ask my patients right after the operation in their wake cream, what is different? What do you feel? And the patient said, listen, doctor, I'm, I'm really not having pain. And, mein Weil bitte, and my nose is already free. The pressure is gone. And these are the typical answers of, of the patients I'm dealing with. Okay, so. Let's say you get to this point in the operation, Andreas, and um, it's all gone pretty smoothly up till now, as, as beautifully as you've dissected it. And then you start getting some troublesome bleeding. What do you, what do, you do in those circumstances? Oh, I blame the anesthetist. I say, oh, well, fix it. Yeah. Fix it. Yeah. No. Um, it depends. I mean, maybe you, you know, you had uh, touched a, a, a little artery, but you can usually see it. If it's getting diffuse bleeding, you talk to the anesthetist, maybe the patient is having higher blood pressure and he can support your work. Or, and what I do is, I repeat using my cotton swabs with adrenaline 1 to 5,000, place it in, or you can use a 2 or 3 percent H2O2 um, um, solution just to control the mucosa oozing. And what I use, a lot of irrigation. I try to irrigate a lot, so the blood is washed away. The surgical field is much brighter because red is taking a lot light and it's getting a darker picture. So I like to have a nice picture and I, ho I hope you can see it nicely here. So well, you see now we have done a partial anterior etmoidectomy. We did not expose a lot here in the frontal sinus, we did a draft type 2A. We did a maxillary sinus opening, Sean, type 2 or even 3. It's a bit, mi we could do a little bit more. Let's say it's a type 2 opening. And according to the EFA classification or the EFA, the extent of frontal sinus surgery, we did a G, a grade 2 opening. So we did not go into the drainage pathway, just staying under and remo removed some of the uh, lower um, anatomical structures. So now, the question is, what is the next step? So uh, you, your assistant, your registrar is calling you and asking you, listen, doctor, listen, consultant, I'm lost. Where I am? Uh, I'm already in the posterior etmoid. What would you say? What would you say? How would you guide your colleagues? So we have Kunzbun. We have the basal lamella here, the first one here from the Ansnet process. And we have here the second one from the etmoidal bulla. And where do we have the basal lamella of the attachment of the middle turbinate at the lateral nasal wall? It's here. We are following here the horizontal posterior part of the middle turbinate and we are looking where this anatomic structure is getting horizon from horizontally to vertical and coming up. And this seems to be the ground lamella of the middle turbinate. So we are not now in the posterior etmoid. We could come back. We are going in between the anterior etmoid, the middle turbinate, we are looking here very gently. This is the super turbinate. Maybe there's a little bit of ice up there or only a little bit water. And these are the structures you will see. We don't see anything open, so we are not already in the posterior etmoid. What I do, I use navigation. Mrs. Hartmann, it's your turn. It's just to demonstrate you. Bitte gerade machen. Yeah, they take this one. Okay, so we're using now navigation. We are not having the pathway now visible. We will do it in a second. But you see here, I'm just in front, you know, of the maybe, yeah, ground lamella. It seems to be Bitte in pathway, number three. Now we had, we were drawing in the pathway into the sphenoid sinus and as you can see here, this should be the right direction into the sphenoid sinus. First, posterior etmoid and then 
this phenoid sinus. So what is a reliable landmark to find the, um, the sphenoid sinus outward tract without having navigation? Bitte wegmachen. Kuhnspun, it's a super turbinate. It's a very helpful, but sometimes it's resected. So it's not always there, so it depends on the case. What I do in such a case, hopefully it's working, we will see. I try to go in and I try to perforate now the ground, the basal lamella. And I try to make an opening. Katharina, how often did you see this kind of surgery? Quite often, huh? Okay. And now we are opening here. We are doing a perforation in the basal lamella, but please keep in mind and make it as a habit. And this is a statement not from me, it's from Heinz Stamberger. Please don't resect here the ground lamella, otherwise you will have a floppy middle turbinate. So you should recognize this is the stability of the middle turbinate and keep it in place, make it as a habit, not just pulling through and you know rushing through. So bitte Zirkulärstanze, die Pilzstanze gerade. Now we are trying to open the posterior ethmoid. Yeah, I get the little one. And you know, for these instruments, I love them, but they are really, you have to clean them, otherwise you can break this punch because the pressure is getting too high when there's too much inside. So now I give it to you once, yeah, okay, this. I get the bigger one. So I try to make it very gently, not tearing, just knipsing away, just punching it away. Um, yeah, bitte mal die elegante Stanze. Die große. Now we are facing a space now where we have to orientate where we are. Oops. So I'm resecting a little bit more of this here. And you have to keep in mind the anterior skull base is coming down the most in the more posterior part. So be aware that you can be much uh, earlier at the level of the skull base. Okay, I tear a little bit mucosa, yes, okay. This happens during surgery as well, but be patient and this shouldn't be a problem. Now I'm cleaning a bit more, Blakesley. So I'm not sure where we are here and what are the structures we will see in a second. What I'm aiming for, what would be for me personally a good landmark? I mean, navigation is fine, but I don't trust 100% navigation. I want to, to be always, I want to have the control about my dissection. So I'm looking for the super turbinate and I'm not sure if I can see it. Can you see the super turbinate? Sean, can you see it? You're closer than I am. Okay, are you all right? Okay, so let's go in. No, I'm sucking. No, I'm not. I don't see it. Okay, bitte Kuhnspoon. Once again, I'm cleaning a little bit this bony lamellas. Okay, so let's see. I could use as well navigation, but I want to see here if I'm getting inside. Okay, so there must be a space here. Can you see it? I try to replace the mucosa here. Oh yes, maybe. This is super turbinate here, yeah? Bitte, uh, Blakesley. So, 
step by step. Okay, uh, through cutting, also schneiden a I want to go very slowly. I, wa I don't want to rush because you should understand the structures and see. So I was looking for this structure. Maybe we are already touching the superturbinate. Resecting the superturbinate is not, you know, usually necessary. It depends. I mean, you can do it if there's uh, indication and there are studies done by David Kennedy and he, he showed that olfaction is not really affected. Um, so let's go in. We can use navigation just in a second for the... Oh, can you see here? It seems to be here. Isn't it interesting, huh? It was not the super turbinate, please, Blakesley. But the beauty of the, f of, of the endoscope is you can look around the corner. For me, it's so convincing. It's so good. So hopefully, no, I want to uh, uh, schneiden. You see, Katharina is always thinking because she's watching. She knows. It's like you dance with your, your partner here and at the table. And it's fantastic because uh, usually we don't talk. It's not because we don't like us, but you know, we are watching and she knows what to give after a while. Okay, so let's go in. Clean a little bit, because that's what you see here. Hopefully you will do at home. So there's a little bit space up there. We can do it a little bit later, but now this seems to be super turbinate here, yeah? And here is the basal lamella of the, inf of the super turbinate. It's the next lamella, a coonspoon. So we are going in. We are fracturing a little bit more of these bony structures. Okay, Blakesley. This is Hartmann. Is the picture still okay? Yeah, are you sure? Good. Please tell me, it's very important. Okay, so now I'm going here, coming from front to back again. Um, um, the Navigation, bitte. To show you where we are now, just to use navigation. Okay, bitte einzeichnen. Okay, we're following here at the pathway. So this would be the trans approach in the direction of the sphenoid sinus or you're using the trans-nasal one. I'm coming back. I'm going between middle turbinate and then coming here to the super turbinate. And here we are. That's a natural ostium. Can you see it? And I made the you know pathway, so uh, hopefully I mean I'm in. Maybe it's not exactly the ostium. I go in now and you see I'm in the sorry, sphenoid sinus here. But now we want to do a trans middle approach. We're coming back. We try not, bitte mal wieder ausschalten. We try not, you know, breaking the ground lamella or even resecting the ground lamella. Kuhnspoon. I think that shows why it's really important to understand your anatomy because the image guidance there was telling us that the sphenoid sinus was lower yes. than it actually was. So it's really important, as uh, Andreas was showing there, to have a full appreciation of the anatomy. and. You use the image guidance as a as a check rather than a definitive yes. procedure. It's more getting your green ticket. You are on the right on the right direction. And now I'm perforating here the basal lamella of the super turbinate. I try not harming the turbinate. Schneider um, Blexley. I tell you, you can easily resect the middle and the super turbinate. The question is why? I mean, these structures are important and there may be some indications, but we are not talking about the rare indications 
or you have to resect it. And we want to show you a functional operation. And you know, and we will talk about this uh, the next days in times of biologicals. I tell you, there will be a great change, a great change. But surgery will stay and you are in the right place here. And you should learn exactly what what uh, Stamberger and, and Messerklinger, you know, published almost 40 years ago. Okay, bitte die kleine um, Rundkopfstanze. And now taking the mushroom punch, should be, should be a little bit clean, the bigger one, please. Okay, you see, I still have the super turbinate in place. I don't want to resect the super turbinate and now I'm not tearing, I'm not tearing, just, you know, making a opening, oops. Going here. Okay. Okay, please once again, the little one. I mean, you could tear all the mucosa out. Yes, of course you can, but the question is why? I mean, when you see how effective Dupilumab, the biologicals are working by a proper, in, uh, um, by a proper indication, I'm not any more convinced about, you know, the concepts which are published and which are promoted about removing all the mucosa. So I think it's still debatable. We can discuss about reboot and uh, because I think reboot can be done much better by medication than by surgery and it's difficult. I never have seen a good reboot in an illustration so I would like to see it. How does it work? So you see I'm still working a little bit yeah, there and yeah, sometimes the instruments. Good. Andreas, can you point out the um, lamina papyracea? Sorry? Can you point out the orbital wall, the lamina papyracea to yes. the audience? I think uh, that's coming in nice. Yes, and yes, nice. yes, yes, that's very important. So for opening the sphenoid sinus, you should be aware about where the, um, where the orbital wall is and uh, as well the skull base as well the apex of the orbit with the um, optic nerve. So this is a very, you know, a very soft and gently opening of the sphenoid sinus. Now I'm enlarging a little bit here, the natural ultra tract. Yes, of course, the damaging should be done very gently. So please, uh, the, um, the elegante stanze. I do a little bit more and then maybe we can have a look inside this. Yeah, the große wäre mir fast lieber. We'll see, yeah, you're right. You see, Katharina is right. She gave me the right instrument. This happens quite often, so they are getting after a while very much experienced and so. Okay, so when you go into the sphenoid sinus, they always medially and inferiorly. That's the safest way. Here, nochmal bitte die große elegante Stanze. Okay, so we're going here, taking this away. There are some bony lamellas up there. There are some cells up there. You can remove these. Now coming more from back to front. I try not tearing out too much of the mucosa. So sucker. Uh -huh. Through cutting, you should be very carefully with the through uh, the Schneider Blexley, with the through cutting instrument, because you know in the posterior etmoid. Maybe you have exposure of what? Structures? Sorry? The optic nerve, yes, and the internal carotid artery. And we have seen nice cases, only single cases, but nice ones, where you could damage these structures in case you are not aware and you're not 
you know, familiar with the anatomy. So I'm okay, nochmal die große elegante Stanze. Oops, I'm going here, a bit higher up. So we expose it. And then now we want to have navigation. Oops. That's what you should avoid. Here's some bony lamella still there. I can feel it, I can see it. But as, as long as you have navigation, just use it. So, okay. So we are looking inside. Are we already there at this calibers? What do you think? Can you see it? We are, yeah? We are touching the anterior skull base in the posterior ethmoid. Here, but there are tiny bony lamellas. We are really in the corner, in the last corner. And now we are going in here. This is sphenoid sinus, and there's some, you know, whatever we see, septation. Pay attention for the septation. Don't go there. Don't fracture, maybe you can injure the internal carotid artery and can make a big problem. Uh, elegante Stanze nochmal. So we still have a part here of cells which are in the ethmoid cavity, which we can resect. I go there. I take this here all away, coming from back to front. Okay. So there's still, yeah, a part, navigation. We will have a look. And uh, once again, for the um, orientation, for the landmarks, you have the maxillary sinus, posterior wall, you have here the opening, you have here the apex of the orbit, where you have to be very cautious, not injuring optic nerve or lower, maybe when you would have a um, onodi cell, a um, sphenoidmoidal cell, the internal carotid artery, then we could go maybe a little bit more laterally here. This w first of all, I will resect this a little bit more, um, Schneidner Blaxley. Now we're doing a more a wider opening, but once again, this is to show you only the possibilities, and it always is dependent on the single case. And this is not a routine maneuver. It depends on the patient's pathology as well, the anatomy. Once again. I try to make now a type 3 enlarging of the maxillary sinus. You see sometimes I'm getting some debris on my endoscope, sorry for this. I try to give you a very nice picture. I have to clean. Now bitte die um, elegante Stanze groß. And when you, when you go in with your endoscope, you see that you should not touch the hairs in the vestibulum nasi because sometimes this can be annoying because you get always debris on your endoscope and then you have to come back again. Take a, a compress or whatever gauze and just dry the entrance. Oh, this is not what you should do. Tearing mucosa, that's bad, no. Trying to, oops, okay, and to fold it back. But for demonstration sake, it's allowed to make this stripping of mucosa, so die große bitte. What is the große? Okay. Okay. So now I'm going here. I'm going more laterally. I know where I am. Wie lang haben wir schon? Zeit. Yeah. What?
you see there's some ice in this sphenoid sinus. Opsala. Okay, so this is a foreign body, isn't it? So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. I have to say, um, the Congress president, Yanis Konstantinidis, as well Witzke Fockens and the whole team, Sean Kerry and Claire, and they did such a great job, and I think we have to say thank you to all these. Uh, as well here for the dissection, I mean, Yanis came yesterday and, you know, and he checked everything, and you, you, you can't believe how much work is behind this. It looks so easy just to stay here and make some preparation, but, you know, to, to organize everything, it takes very much, you know, time and effort, and so thank you to the organizers. So now we are looking now into this phenoid sinus, and let's have a look here. This might be cella, and a little lower down we are to coming to the clivus. Here that's there must be the blue shining here, the internal carotid artery, and a little bit higher, the optic nerve, and uh, we don't want to touch it. What I'm doing now, um, I'm tearing out this mucosa, it's just for demonstration's sake, while... Also, we have noch 45 minutes, okay. Good? Okay. So, usually I don't do it, okay? Uh, usually not, don't do it. It's just to demonstrate, not more, okay? To g get a little bit more information about the anatomy by using the endoscope. Now, I take out this. I love the mucosa. Mucosa is my best friend. So, okay. So, a thick bone here around. And here, this must be here, the run of the, I guess, of the optic nerve, going a little bit more here. And lower down, you have the internal carotid artery. And yes, there are indications to make a decompression of the orbit of the um, optical nerve as well. But this has always to be ruled out by the ophthalmologists and the neurosurgeons. But yes, of course, we as rhinologists, rhinosurgeons, we are doing this. So, well, this is posterioritmoid. It's exposed. Yes, you can polish a little bit more. But now I think we should go up to the frontal, and there are some bony structures that are still in place. Uh, we are switching to... Sorry? Can you come to the front and just talk into the microphone? That'd be really helpful. To yeah, everybody else I don't hear. understand your question. I do. Just, just come down a bit. We can't really. Yes. Hear. Where do you think? Give me the pointer. I, I show you the anatomy. Thank you. What do you think? Where is dura? Do you just, mean yeah, this, this here? This one. This one. Yes, this, this is here. This is a dura. No, that's not dura. No, this is. Dura. No, no. You can. You know. I mean. For me, I, I, I For can... For sure, this is Dura. This is Dura? When you look at the navigation, it's not Dura. There's a cell behind, but thanks very much. It's a good comment because you never know, definitely. You never know. And before I'm, you know, entering the Dura, I would be, you know, I would stop, okay? But yes, you want, to me to, you want me to show it? Okay, you want me to make a CSF leak? Okay, Kuhnspoon would be my first one during a dissection. <laughs> okay, now no, we have a look here. Pooh, more, maybe you're right, huh? Maybe you're right, what do you think? No, no, it's this name. Maybe you're right, I'm not sure. Give me the dünne Sonde for the Sternhülle. But you know, that's are the good things during dissection, because I don't know, you don't know, I mean, navigation showed me, but ah, do I really trust navigation? Yes, I do, but I'm, at the end, responsible for
for what I'm doing, okay? So, okay, what do you think? Yes, yes, here. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard, yeah? Okay. So, um, usually I would open it, I would marsupialize it, but now I take out the mucosa, okay, for demonstration sake, while. Do it very gently. Okay, yes? Agree? We are safe. Thanks very much. Very good. You know, it's like tennis. You played me a ball and I, I, I got it back, okay? Thanks. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So now we are switching to the 45 degree endoscope. I could resect this corner or this, uh, this you know, corner as well, but now we are going forward and we try uh, to show after we open the... Um, this one is for you, this one is for you, and this one is for me. Okay, so. No, but I want to show you a little bit the drill, just to show you how does it work. But first of all, we do the concept of FES, you know, mucosa sparing surgery to the frontal. Frontal is my favorite. I think it's the most challenging one. Oops. Yes, it's not clean. I'm a bit of water. Or is it okay? No. It Excuse me. Um, yes. Hello, I'm Tim Terzis. Yes. Uh, may I ask a question? Uh, yes. Talking about mucosa preservation. Yes. Uh, how would you? Uh, what would you think about using powered instrumentation? Yes, yes. Which would preserve mucosa and... Uh, yes, thank you very much. I mean, when we're talking about preserving mucosa, we are not talking about nasal polyps. I think nasal polyps should be removed either medically or surgically. And this is still the treatment of choice. And I love the shaver, especially for this. And you're definitely true. And uh, maybe we can show the, the shaver. We can uh, bring it in place and now I try to find the way up into the frontal sinus. I'm not sure where the way is up here. What do you think? Is this frontal sinus? Kuhnspoon upended. Now very nice. Ver a lot of uh, nice openings, clefts. I think it's a very complicated anatomy because we don't know where to go. And now I try to expose a little bit more the way up. I'm very high up already. And now I have the 90 degree spoon, Kuhn spoon. Bitte mal die Olive. Yes. I think there's still a cell here, a cell here, which could be opened. We will see if this is skull base or not. But now I'm taking the mushroom punch and I'm going up here. I'm just exposing the drainage pathway. Oops. Okay, so have a look here. Is this frontal sinus? What do you think? Sorry? It's not the frontal. Okay, it's skull base, isn't it? Yeah, it's a kind of a cell which is doing high up. Bitte mal die um, das Krokodil seitlich. Now, I don't want to tear mucosa out of this area. I want to, to do a sharp dissection. Um, Krokodil, yeah. And I show you one of my favorite instruments. They are fantastic. It's called, because it's looking like a crocodile. I call it always crocodile. I go here and I nibble it away. And you should have it in your setting because it gives you a lot of support by doing the concept of functional surgery. And as you can see here, I can, oops, 
I can re remove the mucosa very gently, but I'm not in the frontal. Where's the frontal? I cannot see the frontal. I see some, some openings, but huh, we'll see. Bitte, um, oops. So, now I'm using navigation just to show you. Ah, uh, there seems to be something up there. Können Sie das ein bisschen mehr biegen an der Spitze? So, it's, um, you can adapt this kind of uh, this kind of pointer, which is very nice. It's for the electromagnetic system, and when we go up here, I think we are slowly approaching the frontal sinus, and I think maybe, or not, there seems to be some bony lamella up there. I don't know, I mean, have a look up there. Where is the entrance? What do you think? Do you think here? This way? Okay, so you see, it's not easy, you know, because it can be complicated. What do you think? Where to go? Okay. So, Kuhnspoon, the normale. Normale erstmal. It's boring to have a cadaver, which is easy, okay? So, what is here? Do you think, do you think that's skull base? Are you sure? What do you think here? Okay, so y you won't go here, huh? Now, we will see. I'm not sure where to go. I'm not sure, but let's see. Is this the way in the frontal? What do you think? I'm not sure. We'll see. Okay, so um, this thing is not open side. In a patient, please leave the mucosa, okay? Okay, so I take out the bony lamellas here, tiny ones. Where is the frontal? Can you see the frontal? There are some, you know, is it this skull base or is it a cell? Usually, this is for demonstration, please. Don't do it. Okay, thank you. So, I go up here. I try to find my way up. Give me please the, the, uh, the Castel Novo sonde. I think that's a tricky frontal, mm. Terzis, huh? I'm not sure if we can go here. Do you think that's the right way? Oh, can you see it here? Is it skull base? Thank you. Oh, it's a relief for me. Thank you, nach vorne oben. No, it's okay, it's okay. So, we're going up here taking the bony lamellas out again. The, the orbit is quite weak here, so pay attention. I clean it a little bit more. Dann kriege ich bitte das Krokodil. Nach vorne. Okay, so um, we still have something to resect here. That's not skull base here. This here, that's not skull base. But I can show you by navigation. And usually when we talk about the anterior edmund artery, I mean, I don't go for the artery and look and always want to see it. I mean, sometimes I see it, sometimes not, it's okay. But as long as you see it, it's fine. Don't touch it. So now, this is now the entrance into the frontal sinus. But I think 
there's still some, you know, space behind, yeah, some cell compartments, uh, bit it in pointer. And when I checked yesterday this anatomy, I thought, oh, it's not very easy, you see, here behind, that's, that's not skull base. Weil, bitte. Okay, so I take out the mucosa, sorry for that, but it's, you know, to show you the bone, the relation of the structures, okay? Good. So, going here. Okay, bitte den schneidenden, äh, die, die Skrokodil. Yeah. Okay. Can you see it here? Professor? Can yes. You, uh, could you show us where, um, in your opinion, uh, it's the most uh, uh, dangerous spot to make a damage to the orbit? Yes. To the orbit or to the anterior skull base? Both. Or both? Both, yes. both. Okay. You know, to the orbit, I would say, yes, it's around here, a very thin part. It's getting a little bit harder lower down. And in case of uh, Graves' disease, when you have a, a endocrine orbitopathy, I mean, you can uh, decompress the orbit. That's done very easily by removing a part of the lamina papyracea and the floor of the maxillary uh, of the orbit until the level of the infraorbital nerve. And then you make a, a, a longitudinal and a crosswise um, in insertion of the uh, periorbit so the fat can come out, but pay attention not blocking the alpha tract of maxillary or frontal sinus. And for the, um, the question for the thinnest part as well for the anterior skull base, can you see the run of the anterior atomidal artery very nicely? It's coming down uh, from the orbit along the skull base onto the here uh, uh, lateral lamella of the lamia cribrosa and it gives branches where to the septum and to the um, to the um, um, anterior part of the middle turbinate as well the onset process and exactly here where we are that's the thinnest part of the lamina uh, of the anterior skull base the lamina cribrosa um, bitte die sonde now i want to remove a little bit more of the bone here up there and then we take we show you a type 2 approach to the um, to the frontal sinus you see here can dissect a little bit more. So, okay. Okay, please give me the pointer. I think there's a cell behind there as well. We'll see. Just in a second. Yeah, I think so. So, das Zänglichen nach oben vorne. So the um, ligation or preparation of the sphena palatine artery is very important and I would like to show it to you as well. Have a look here. When I, when I tear the mucosa, I think you will see the anterior atomidal artery. Can you see it? Very nicely, yeah? The red one. Now here. here. That's it. Know. Oops. Thank you. So I tear the mucosa here just to show you Okay, bit this crocodile. So just you see that's a bony lamellar seems to be a, a supra bulla or even a supra bulla frontal cell which is going very high up. Now I take the bony, the cap of this 
structure to expose the drainage pathway. Okay, um, das Zänglichen, das Kleine. So, usually you let the mucosa there. I tear it out just to show you how does it look like when you go up there. Uh, that's the bony lamellas which were blocking the outward tract in this case. And you can go there and you can just, you know, make a little bit more, pre more precise um, dissection. Okay, so, good. Weil, that's the last steps. in making a full, a complete frontosphenoidectomy. Good. There are some tiny bony lamellas. Usually we would take it out like this here. And pay attention here. That's the artery. Okay, so now have a look inside. We're sucking out the debris. Blakesley, showing you how does it look like when it's widely opened. Okay, so here's some tiny bony lamellas. We we'll leave it there. Okay, so it's a wide opening. Yes, you could do a little bit more there. You see the artery, you see the sphenoid sinus, skull base. It's not polished 100%, but that's what we don't do. That's the entrance into the um, into the frontal sinus. And now, I think two more steps. How much time do we have left? About half an hour. Oh, but that's good. 20 minutes, half an hour. Actually, 20 minutes. Yes. Okay. So now, um, in case of a bleeding, of a posterior nasal bleeding, um, there's a good way how to handle this in kind of looking for the sphenoid palatine artery, the foramen and the artery, and how can you do it? I mean, there are usually four locations where spurting vessel can occur. It's first of all here when you enlarge inferiorly or posteriorly the maxillary sinus osteum, or you uh, resect the concha bullosa, and you have at the end of the of the posterior third of the um, middle turbinate, here an artery, a branch of the sphenopalatine artery, or you have um, some arteries which can be in the posterior part of the nose around the sphenoid sinus ostium, the inferior part, and uh, this can be the source for, you know, arterial bleeding, which can be not very nice, and now where to find this phenopalatine artery when you go in and you are looking for the posterior end of the middle turbinate, you will find around here the one or even more. And there's a nice study done by Nick Jones and Daniel Simon from 2006, and they found out that the uh, phenopalatine artery can have up to, I don't know, eight or even ten branches which can bleed in the posterior part of the nose. So uh, be aware about this. So now, um, Josef, what, what, what you can do is uh, to do a straightforward procedure just to find the foramen and the corresponding artery. You can make here when you open the maxillary sinus osteum and you do uh, um, about one centimeter anteriorly here at the end of the um, at the um, middle turbinate, you make a little cut here and you go in and you try to make a mucoperiosteal flap, very important, and you elevate it, not only a, a mucosa flap, it's a mucoperiosteal flap. And now we're going in and hopefully I can demonstrate this in the right way. I'm going in, it's a very tiny bone here. And the, so what we are touching here is 
a reliable landmark. It's called Crista et Moidalis. And the Crista et Moidalis um, helps you in identifying and in uh, seeing the um, artery. And now we are doing a little bit, it's very tiny bone here. Give me the, the Blake's leap there. I take out the bony lamellas first. Would be nice to have, oops. Okay, so now it's coming. Yes, give me the Freya. So by pulling the mucoperosal flap medially, ideally, maybe you will find the artery. We'll see in a second, hopefully. And now, don't do it too much, otherwise, ah, it's up here. That must be a crystate modalis, and that's here the arteries coming out. I have to elevate this a little bit more. So I think you can see it here, that's the arteries coming up. It's narrow. So here, can you see it now? That's the foramen, and uh, bitte my an dünne Sonde, nehmen my the Kieferhundsonde. And in case it's a bleeding, a bleeder, you can either clip, coagulate, or whatever you have um, to stop the bleeding. But be aware, in case it's still bleeding, maybe the uh, source is not this branch, is another one. And here you can go into this phenopalatine opening here. Okay, then when you have done this, okay, yet I don't like the bony lamellas, usually I take them out. You replace the mucosa here and you just bring gel form a little bit on it and that's the procedure. Okay, that's for, you know, dealing with bleedings in the posterior part of the nose. Okay, so now maybe demonstrating you what you should avoid by um, showing you how you can create a CSF leak. Kuhnspoon, please. Let's see if I can show it to you in the right way. So here it's tiny, very tiny, and that was a question of you. Thank you very much. So this is the artery, yes. And the artery is here going into the anterior skull base, and maybe when you're pushing too much here, too much, either you have a bleeding and a CSF leak. This is a not, okay, don't, okay, please don't, but I have to show it, we will see. So when we go in here, now let's go back, or let's see if we have pointer. I leave my instrument in, hopefully it stays, and I try to come endonasally, hopefully it's working to show you if I'm right or not. Oh, can you see? I'm higher than the olfactory cleft and I'm intracranially. And this is what you definitely should avoid. Don't do it. And if this happens, yes, of course, I mean, you have to deal with this. Can you see it here? Oh, we have CSF leak. Can you see it's running? And I have to mention, and the Stortz, uh, you know, um, team t told me, these instruments are not um, what has registered for skull base surgery, but this can happen. So usually you don't do this, but they are at, at this moment not registered. So you have to wait, there's a big process going on and it will come will take maybe a year or even longer, but this has to be mentioned, it's very important. So, now we have done a CSF leak, but this was just for demonstration, you have seen this, yeah? It's up here, that's a very, very dangerous area, yeah? And it's the same for the uh, lamina papyracea. I can't ask you a question exactly, because it depends, you, w you will have sometimes the histens in the bony, uh, protection here to the orbit in the lamina papyracea, but I don't know where, so 
pay attention to the whole area and as well when you come to the apex yeah, of the orbit. Okay, so now I'm showing you maybe how we could um, uh, print uh, from the principal here do a type 2a op uh, type 2b opening of the frontal sinus den bohrer müssen wir bitte mal fertig machen um, please through cutting blakesley um, ich würde den uh, den schnellen machen ja den schneidenden so there's first of all the indication must be clear of course But in case you have osteomas, I have quite a lot of osteomas and I love the type 2B approach. And many of the osteomas, not every osteoma, um, I can resect by this approach. But when you do it, first of all, you have to enlarge the excess. And then how to do it? You have to resect a part of the middle turbinate. And usually you make an axillary flap, my sickle knife. Yes, we still have time, that's good. Okay, so you go a little bit above the axilla of the middle turbinate. Yeah, hold the head and we make a flap here. We go directly on the bone. You can make it wider, higher up as well, but I always try and start like this. Dann bitte mein Freya. You can even save this flap or you can, you know, just resect the flap. We'll see how does it work. So now I'm preparing, I'm preparing this. So, and this is not a standard procedure. It's just to show you the different possibilities. And I think it's a better approach from internally than from externally. Okay, so. Dann der Through-Cutting, der schneidende Blaxley. So I take this flap away just to show you a bit better. It's like this. Now the next step is I resect a part of the axilla of the middle turbinate. And how much? That's the question. I do it until I reach the level of the posterior wall of the frontal recess. Like this, check. So. And I tell you, this is a surgical procedure, and I think for the more advanced surgeon and You know, I think we should train it because there are some pathologies which require such an approach, but the number is very low. It depends what is your, you know, what patients you're dealing with, but I don't do it quite often. Huh? So, okay. okay, so this is now a wider opening. What you could use now is the punch, please, the, um, the elegante stanze. And you could use the punch just to remove this bone here or drill the bohrer. It's to show you the punch makes sense. And this is now the drill. It's a 35,000 unit drill it's very nice it's a very clear clean drilling and you have this one usable um, sharp diamonds and it's 40 degrees bended and now okay and you take it you have irrigation at the tip you have the suction at the tip You can do as well a very gently opening. Like this here. Okay, so now when you stay on one side and you are, um, and you want to open only one side, 
you can do it differentiated. You can do a partial, more kind of aggressive opening, and according to the EFES classification of PJ Wormald, there's a grading four when a part of the internal beak, and now we are touching the internal beak, is removed. And when you, when you remove the entire, the whole, the whole um, internal beak, then it's a grade five opening, one-sided, complete one-sided opening. This, I would remove this a little bit more to get more access. Coming closer, getting more opening, more excess, a beautiful excess opening in a very complex anatomy, I think. Okay, I still have the zero degree endoscope, but now I'm switching to the 45. You know, there are two different ways um, how you can uh, approach the frontal sinus with a drill. It's the line of sight approach, the direct way, which I showed you just now, or, and this is what I prefer as well, it's the round the corner approach. And I think this is very nice after you started with the line of sight approach and then you want to do it you more, more gently. And I am going up here now. And you see there's still the internal beak up there. Give me the punch. I show you how does it feel, the Zirkulärstanze, the Aufgebogene. Uh, yes, maybe we show the Hosemann. Now let's, let's show the Hosemann. There's another punch which is more aggressive. It's uh, designed by Werner Hosemann. He's a very good rhinologist from Germany and has done a lot of work and thanks for all his work. And now we can go here and you can just make one bite, you make another bite, and I'm going up here again, and you see three bites. It's very strong and pay a bit, little bit of tension here to the medial wall. I'm now coming closer to the type, um, to the type to um, B or G5 opening. I think later on we should show with navigation where we are. Now, this is just to show you the different ways how you can do it. Now, I'm opening this again widely, wider. A good control. Yes. Yeah. And I yeah. have the question, uh, Professor, what should we do to avoid the scarifying of mucosa in the frontal recess? Sorry, sca uh, scarifying Damage. mucosa. Damage to mucosa. Okay, okay, yes. Um, that's a very good question. I mean, it's up to your preparation. I mean, when you do a circular um, traumatization of the mucosa, the risk of resinose is quite high. So my recommendation is follow the principles of the School of Graz and dissect very gently the bony lamellas, leave as much as possible, but look for the drainage pathway. You know, it depends on the case. I can't say it's always possible, but in many cases it, it is. And what I have done here, yes, of course, I teared mucosa and, you know, in a, in a surgical case, I would not do it, but here, to understand the anatomy, the relation between the artery, the skull base, the frontal recess, I think it's necessary. Otherwise, I wouldn't uh, be able to show it. And as you can see here, a wide opening in. It's, of course, you can take this bony lamellas away uh, as well, and then you get a wider opening. Jetzt mal nochmal die Hosemann-Stanze. Yeah. And uh, one more question. Uh, do you observe about uh, uh, after the draft surgery some restenosis? Because in our uh, clinic we observed, and uh, what should we do to avoid this? Yeah, that's a good some question. Yes, of course, I observe some it. Some flap of mucosa because when we drill the bone, uh, we um, 
damage the mucosa and yes yes you're right i mean when you do a drill out and you don't open it widely enough maybe the risk for restenosis is quite high i tried several cases by using local treatment by propel stand you know the mometasone coated stand i think some patients did quite well some did not and as long as you have a tricky frontal sign as you drilled and it's coming a restenosis again can be very hard i have these cases um, usually these are cases who are referred to me um, then you have to try i mean you have to come again maybe you maybe you have to drill again and then you will see if a stand will make sense but my experience is the stand i'm talking about the propel stand doesn't make really sense uh, when you have denoted bone so a wide exposure then would be the best way how to prevent when you do this kind of traumatic surgery and this is really rescue surgery this is only limited for single single cases so this is a type 2 opening i can do a little bit more to give you a nice um, final um, picture of this opening yes of course you can do a little bit more here it depends on the on the osteoma you have to take out but in case it's a big osteoma you have a wide, to make a wide opening and I would prefer, prefer this kind of approach to deal with a pathology which is able to be taken out but this has to be done in the hands of an experienced surgeon of course and as well the equipment I mean no, not everybody is having all the equipment so I think this should be fine now it's a wide opening you can see it and this won't stenose I mean this keeps open I'm sure I mean there's no I think no risk uh, to have restenosis so for a type 3 opening there's a difference because you have to resect part of the septum uh, to make a window which is two to three centimeters wide and then you do the same on the other side like I have done here you s resect the septum the you know the the um, the floor of the frontal sinus to the uh, uh, interfrontal sinus septum and you can even here resect a part I don't do a complete resection to the highest point but I open it widely and even a type 3 opening makes sense in some rare cases but this is not the focus of what we want to show you t today so give me please uh, the, my, the, the bipolar pinzette so in case you have a bleeding Null grad optic. So, this might work. Okay, Sean, how, man, uh, how, how much time do we have left? You've got one and a half minutes. One and a half minutes. Okay, yeah. so. Are there any questions in the meantime? Give me. Yeah. Okay. In case you have a bleeding, you know. Have a look here. You can take this in a suction bipolar. You can go there and make bzz, 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 and then you, you, you can deal with your bleeding. The other one, give me mal die andere, diese schwarzen. And there's another nice instrument which you should use in case you have a bleeding. You can go there and if there's an artery, you go there and you make a bipolar coagulation. Yeah. Okay, so this is so far what I could show and I would li like to make a, a final statement but first maybe we are uh, uh, asking yeah. the questions. Uh, professor, I think uh, uh, we should have made a comment about the agonist eye cell and how they block the frontal sinus. Probably it would have been more useful for the audience here. Sorry, once w again? Would you like to make a comment on agar nasi cells and how they block the frontal sinus opening? Yes, that's good, that's good. Agar nasi cell is quite a common cell and it's, um, I would say, in 90 or even more percent there. And in case the patient is having problems and you have a blocked frontal sinus, this can be the source, the reason, and then you have to make your proper dissection. And the agar nasi cell is the most anterior epimoidal cell. And you usually, when you resect it, you do take the antenna process and between the agonase cell and antenna process, there's, a, there's a, um, a conjunction. So the antenna process goes medially and posteriorly into the agonase cell. There are some discussions going on. And when you resect both of these structures, this is for me the most important thing, how to open 
the way into the frontal recess, the different cells, and further on into the frontal sinus. So it's a very good question. Aganasi cell is very important. And you should understand where the cell is. Yeah? It's the most anterior cell, and there's a, a conjunction to the Anzen process. Okay. Sorry? I wanted to yeah. make was that one has to go through the agonization yeah, yeah. 86 to 90 percent of the time. Yeah, you're and right. I mean, that's what I said. Unless we do that, probably we'll never be able to open the frontal sinus. You're problem. right. I mean, there's a nice paper published by Peter Womart, the agonasi cell, the key to understand the approach to the frontal sinus, and that's exactly what you said. You have to open the agonasi, and when you understand Ansnap process and agonasi, you will be able, I mean, this is training, and hold the endoscope in the right position. They're very good, yeah? Professor Leunig, in general, or in this case, do you uh, fixate the middle terminate transeptally? No. Never? No, I try to keep the ground lamella in place. Even when you resect the axilla of the middle terminate, it will be stable. Of course, some exceptions may exist, but usually it works, yeah? And I don't make stitching or maybe in some single cases I do a, a, the bulgarization, I do a little bit scratching on the medial part of the middle terminate and the septum so you get a little neck here and this is just like a scar which is holding the middle terminate. So these are all tips and tricks, very helpful. Thanks for your question. One last question. Yeah, and then I make my final statement. Yes? Sorry, I don't know that we have enough time. Uh, can you perform a lateral cantotomy? Yes, of course, but not yet. But we will do it. I can show it by video if you want. I'm sorry for this, but we are limited to time. But you know, um, you have seen a, a complete frontal sphenoidectomy by not harming the middle and the superior turbinate. And you have seen a full endoscopic procedure and all the possibilities that, you know, this kind of technique provides with different instruments, things for thoughts. And uh, I think, however, this has only to be done when the patient is really symptomatic and you have to adapt, you have to individualize your surgery. So the beauty of FES, and this is a statement by Heinz Stamberger, the beauty of FES and the endoscope is that you can avoid in many, many cases extended surgery. So I hope with my team, Katharina, uh, Mrs. Hartmann uh, and uh, Lucas Leis and Antonio and Carter, of course, Sean, we hope you enjoyed the dissection as much as we did. And we hope you can take some advice. <laughs> so some advice, tips and tricks for your daily work and of course for your patients and for the benefit of the patient. Enjoy the Congress and thanks for coming and look at our courses and our presentations. They are coming more and hopefully you come. Thank you very much.